Oh, that was powerful. <laughs> Happy Easter, everybody. Indeed, we do stand forgiven at the cross. Today is a day in which we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, the proof, the evidence of our great hope. He said he would be resurrected, and indeed he was. And we stand in that promise, and we stand in his life. And it's good for us to celebrate. It's good for us to sing. It's good to us to um, enjoy what God has given to us through Christ. By the way, it's great to see you. You look great today. I even tucked in my shirt for those of you. I dressed up. <laughs> and you're really funny. Okay, so we're going to dismiss kids. Kids, you're dismissed to go to Children's Church. So yeah, just head through these places, go back here, head that way. The children's workers are waiting for you there. I'm sure it'll be a great time downstairs, and they'll come up again after the service is over. Well, this for sure has been a um, very difficult and tragic week for the city of Rockford. Um, there's been, of course, a lot of tears, um, a lot of sorrow, a lot of grief, a lot of love shown, um, a lot of comfort extended. I am and we should be grateful for the promise that we have in Christ. Many of us have felt these things personally, and uh, some of us have been impacted um, very, very deeply. We, as a community of faith, look to, in times of deep and overwhelming sorrow, we look to Christ. It is comforting for us to know that Jesus himself was a man of sorrow and familiar with suffering. And when we call to him, he comes to us by his spirit. He walks with us in the joys of the resurrection and he walks with us in the tragedies and the difficulties of life. There are family members here with us today who have lost a mom or a brother and a spouse. Grandma and uncle and friends. So in moments that are mixed with great and glorious hope, we also grieve at tragedy and difficulty. God gives us strength and grace to walk in continued hope, continued love, and continued faith as we look to shine the light of Christ in a community that desperately needs him. So my encouragement for us as a congregation and even for a city as a whole, that we would think about things that are most important, that we would live the promises of Christ who says that he has prepared a place for us. We will embrace one another in sorrow, in suffering, in grief, knowing that those who are in Christ, we will see again. So this week, indeed, and this next week, we will continue to weep with those who weep. We will provide comfort and love any way we can and pray for one another. Often when there is tragedies in cities and communities and families, often we turn towards God and towards prayer, and rightly so. My prayer has been that we would turn towards God, not away from God. 
And in the providence of God, we are starting a new series next week that deals with a man who is struggling with the goodness of God in the midst of difficulties. He cried out, Habakkuk cried out, how long, O Lord, will you allow violence and suffering and tragedies to continue? God, again, in his providence, set this up even months ago, that we will walk with Christ and we'll walk with scriptures as we grapple with the realities of this world that is fallen, that is broken, that is suffering at times. Habakkuk gives us language for this, helps us as he questions God and God responds and he responds back to God and God responds. And then chapter three of that book, there is a prayer. And the conclusion, by the way, of this book that Habakkuk the prophet himself embraces is that the righteous will live by faith. As we faithfully hold on to the promise of God that there will be justice in the end. So we will be walking in that book together for eight weeks. And it is appropriate for us to do this. God is deeply present in overwhelming pain and sorrow. And yet we hold that reality with one hand and embrace the reality of the promise of resurrection of life with the other and live in that faith. Next Friday, um, uh, the funeral services for uh, Ramona and Jake Schubach will be um, here. Friday from 4 to 8 is a visitation that's going to happen here, and then um, Saturday morning, 9.30 uh, to 10.30 be another visitation where the funeral service will happen at 11 and lunch following. Please continue to pray for the families who have been uh, affected by um, unimaginable suffering. Please continue to pray for our community as we look to heal, to make sense of. Please continue to hold on to the truth and the love and the grace of Christ that promises new life in him that we, of course, celebrate today. So as promised, um, we are going to do a complete overview of the book of John. So I've brought all 52 of my sermons, and I'll be going through them. I will not. <laughs> Stack is like this. But how do you um, wrap up a book such as the Gospel of John? And if you came in, there are notes for you out there. There's notes that can be downloaded if you're online. We're grateful that you're joining us today. Happy Easter to you. You can look at these things. So I'm going to talk about what the, this book was all about. I'm going to talk about the claims that Christ made through his I am statements. We're going to look at the seven miracles and what they were about. Ending with a question for all of us, do you believe? John, as you know, and if you've been with us over this past year or so, or so, you understand this verse in John chapter 20, verse 31. John tells us explicitly why he wrote this gospel. He says, these things were written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you and I and all people may have life in his name. He wrote this book to bring forward the evidence of who Christ is, which is of utmost importance. 
He brought to the surface the claims of this man. And even from the beginning, this glorious opening to this book, declaring the one who was always and who created all things, coming in the flesh to be among us, living in grace and truth. And John goes on writing page after page, account after account, bringing forward evidence so that those who are reading in his day those who have read in our day, those who are continuing to read in the future, would understand and then make a decision about who this man was, who this man is, and why it matters. Jesus said things that no other person had ever said before, and he claimed things that no other person has ever claimed before. Jesus did things that no other person has ever done before. So the question is, who is this man Jesus? John drew his conclusion and put it forward and said, I know who he is. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the promised one. He is the word became flesh. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Savior. He is the Lord. He is the Son of God. And because of his promise, if we believe, we then are granted sonship and daughtership and becoming part of God's family and eternal life in his name. Now this word believe is not just like, oh, I know some facts about Jesus, right? I believe he existed. I believe things about him. That's not what the word believe in this gospel means. By the way, John used it about 98 times in this short and powerful book. The word believe, in the context that John used, it means that you rely on and trust in Jesus. This is not just, well, I know some things about him, or I go to church on certain days, or it's a part of who I am to a degree, compartmentalized. He says, wait a second. What this means, this word believe means, is that you have entrusted yourself to him. You have given yourself over to him and you rely upon him for his promise to give us new life and he promises new life through his Holy Spirit. And they're promised when he says that I will come back again. I have indeed prepared a place for you, and in me your sins have been forgiven. So therefore we are now the righteousness of Christ before God and have peace with him. This is incredible. It is remarkable. And John, having um, laid these things out in this book, we're going to talk about what Christ Claim. So this is the first point, what Jesus said himself about his identity. Now this phrase, I am, is a significant phrase in Scripture. When God revealed himself to Moses, at that time a wandering shepherd for 40 years, an 80-year-old man grew up in the house of Pharaoh and then was in the wilderness for 40 years, God, hearing the response of his people, setting these things up from time ago, revealed himself in a bush that would not burn in fire. Moses encountered God. And in that conversation, Moses asked, what's your name? And God revealed himself with this name, I am who I am. The Israelites understood this being God's identifying name. And 
as that name is seen throughout the Old Testament and the people of God re- related to God. There was a 400 year gap and then on the scene came the, a new work of God that this promised son, this crusher of the this head of the serpent in the garden was coming on the scene. And Jesus grew up in the backwater, in the backwoods, and he came to a time of ministry, and he came on the scene, and people wondered who this was. John, in his gospel, records actually two sets of sevens of Jesus talking about and saying and claiming, I am. John included seven stories where at key moments, Jesus simply states, I am connecting to this name. And perhaps the most striking instance of this is when the um, ruling religious leaders at that time were confronting Jesus and talking about Abraham. And they said, do you think that you're greater than our father Abraham? And Jesus replies in this way, before Abraham was I am. He did not say before Abraham was, I was claiming deity, but I am that name. And they knew exactly what Christ meant. Now, here are statements, and then I'm going to bring them to us, and I want you to consider what Christ said. More than any preacher, more than anything that was written, these are the words of Christ. And I want you to deal with and understand and hopefully absorb what was said by Christ himself and what he declared himself to be. The first one we run into in the Gospel of John, and all of the references are there in your notes. They're not on the screens, but they are in your notes. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And I want to look at what the Old Testament says and then how it relates to Jesus in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, God provided bread from heaven. If you are familiar with your Bible, it was called manna. God provided this bread from heaven for the Israelites to sustain them in the wilderness so they could live. When Jesus says, I am the bread of life, he is the bread from heaven. He is the bread of life who satisfies and sustains his children so that we can live eternally. Do you see what Christ was doing there? Second, in the Gospel of John, we see Jesus declaring this statement. He said, I am the light of the world. Now, if you know, again, your Old Testament history, and the, those who were reading the Old Testament understood this concept of God being the light, because as the people of Israel, the people of God, were moving away from bondage in Egypt, they had a pillar of flame that led them at night. God appeared to them as a light that allowed them to see, that gave them protection. And when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he's saying, listen, I am the one that provides light. I am the one that can provide protection. I am the one by which you can see all things. This is what he was claiming. He indeed is our light. He indeed is our bread. And then he continues in John chapter 10. He claimed this as he was teaching in the context of his disciples being confronted by religious authorities. He said, I am the door of the sheep. He was referring to this in the Old Testament, that God provided the door of righteousness which is called the door of the Lord. It was the only way to enter into God's house and into God's presence. When Jesus said that he is the door, 
He meant this, that he is the door of righteousness. He is the door of the Lord. And if you want to enter into the presence of God, you must go through him. This is an incredible statement that he said about himself. If you want to enter into the Father's house, I'm the door. I'm the righteous one, and through me you can enter because there is no other way, but I am that way. In the same passage in John chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. In the Old Testament, God was the only one who was qualified to take care of his flock. He set up other people and they failed and failed and failed. And God said, I am the shepherd. I am the good shepherd who make my sheep lie down, who walk beside them in still waters, who rod and staff comfort them. And even though we walk in the valley of the shadow of death, we do not have to fear. Why? Because he is with us and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, he is the good shepherd who calls his sheep by name, who loves us, cares for us, lays down his life for us. That's what we have in Christ. Now John, by the power again of the Holy Spirit, records another phrase claim of Christ, who said, I am the resurrection and the life. Now in the Old Testament, God is the only one who gives life. God was the only one that could bring the dead back to life. And then in Jesus, he is the one who gives life. He is the one that gives back to life. If we believe in him even though we die we will live every person in this room is immortal do you know that mortality one day death one day will be destroyed Christ says, where, O death, is your sting? Where is your victory? Because he holds the keys to life itself. He is the resurrection. He is the life. He claimed this. Do you believe this? Or was he a raving lunatic? This is what he said. He also said in John 14, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. In the Old Testament, God teaches the way, God is the one who reveals the truth, God is the one who rescues his children from death. But in Jesus, he says, I am the way we can and should walk, I am the truth revealed, I am the life. And through him we receive life eternal. If we know him, we know the Father. Lastly, Jesus' claims in saying again, ego a me, which is the Greek I am. He says, I am the true vine. And we'll be like, what is he talking about? <laughs> right? But if you understand it in context, you understand the weight of these statements. In the Old Testament, by the way, Israel's, one of its symbols was a grapevine. It was on actually the, um, the temple and the doors had these grapevines as a symbol of the people of God. God prophesied and said that this vine will be throughout the world. And this true vineyard will fill the whole world with its fruit. When Jesus said, I am the true vine, 
He was saying that I am the root of all things that are good and right and holy and righteous. And if you are connected to me, John 15, as the vine to a branch and as a branch to the vine, then my fruit will indeed fill the whole earth. This is staggering. These claims are significant and we have to consider them. Jesus is the great king. He's not some weak and and wimpy little dude standing in the corner hoping that you would pick him for your softball team. We kind of sometimes paint him that way, right? Well, he's Jesus. Take him or leave him. Or, hey, you know what? I'll see you when I need you. Jesus is the great king. Jesus is the creator of all things. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. Jesus is the shepherd. He is the vine. He is the door. He is the bread. He is the light. This is what he says to us. Do you believe? Do you treasure him? Rely on him. Love him more than you love anyone or any. Jesus claimed these things. John presents these to us, and we must consider them and what it means about him and what it means for us. Now, as Jesus made these claims, he also was doing things. Now, it's one thing to say you are these things, Right? Anyone could say, well, I'm the Messiah, and by the way, many have done so, and many will do so in the future. Easy to say, hard to prove. And Jesus, in making all of these claims, then backed them up by doing what only God can do. That's the point of the miracles, by the way. We think often that the primary points of Jesus doing miracles was to relieve some suffering. And yes, indeed, it relieved suffering. That's the secondary point. The primary point was to show us that he is indeed God. That was the purpose Will God make all things right in the end? Yes. Will he restore all things? Yes. Will he bring justice? Yes. Will he wipe away every tear? Yes. But he did these things during that time to prove his identity. First miracle we run into in the book of John is John chapter 2, where Jesus turned water into wine. God in the Old Testament, by the way, By his will, God changed one thing into another thing. He changed dust and made it into a human being. He changed a staff into a snake. He turned water into blood. He turned dirt into gnats. He turned dew into manna. This is something that only God can do. Jesus, in stepping into this very first miracle, by his word, one thing was changed dramatically into another thing. He didn't put a little drops of you know, food coloring in there to make it look like wine. It was the real thing. And by the way, the best thing. Something that takes Years to create, he did it in an instant. In gallons and by great volume, pointing to his identity. John records another miracle. (laughs) And he said, by the way, at the end of the book, hey, if I recorded all the stuff about Jesus, the whole world would not have space for the volumes that would have been written. 
But he specifically chose these so that they would point to his identity. Next thing we run into in John chapter 4, Jesus healed the official's son. Now God in the Old Testament, God sent out his word according to Psalm 107 and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Now Jesus in the New Testament, Jesus sends out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Jesus did what only God could do. An official had a son who was sick, came to him, Jesus spoke and he was healed. Who can do that? God can. The third miracle we run into in the Gospels is this. Jesus healed a paralytic at Bethesda. This is John chapter 5. In the Old Testament, God restores the incurable to stand before him. In Jesus, he restores the incurable to stand before him. Jesus did what only God could do. Again, Jesus performed another miracle. This is where he feed, fed the 5,000 in John 6. Now, in the Old Testament, there was an event similar to this of the foreshadow, where God multiplied food to feed a crowd. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus multiplied food to feed a crowd. Jesus did what only God can do. Next, we see, as recorded by John, that Jesus walked on water. Job describes God as one who treads upon the waves. Jesus, when he appeared, he did that very thing. If you compare these, this prophecy and what God does and what Jesus did, he walked or treaded upon the waves. He can only do what God can do. Jesus healed a man who was born blind. This wasn't an optometrist trying to improve someone's sight. This was someone who could not see, did not have the, the physical capacity to see. In the Old Testament, God opens the eyes of the blind. And Jesus in the New Testament, Jesus is the one who opens the eyes of the blind. Jesus did what only God could do. And near the end of his ministry, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. In the Old Testament, God again was the only one who could do this. And in the New Testament, Jesus is the one who does this. Jesus did what only God could do. So we have to take his claims of Christ. I am these things. We have to take the miracles of Christ doing what only God can do and consider what this means about him. Oh yeah, and I forgot one other detail. He said he was going to die and rise again. The ultimate proof of his identity. He predicted it to his followers, saying exactly what would take place and exactly what he predicted happened. Even in his death and in his life, he fulfilled over 300 Old Testament prophecies to the T. God orchestrated the thing so that we would know who this is. He is a man unlike any others. He is the Christ, the Son of God. Do you believe? Jesus indeed rose again, rose again, witnessed by his closest friends time and time again, witnessed by groups of people at numerous occasions. And he said, I'll be back. Carry this story to the ends of the world. This is the hope of Easter. This is the hope of Christ. Do you believe? That's the question that Scripture puts forward to us today. 
That is the question that John puts forward to us today. That is the question that the Holy Spirit, Christ, and God himself puts forward to us today. Do you believe? Have you treasured? Do you trust? Are you relying upon Christ for your life and for your life eternal? Most of us in here believe. And hopefully, if you have been with us, that you have loved Christ deeper and you honor Him fuller and you look to worship Him for who He is. May His glory be seen to greater and greater degrees in your life. Know Him, walk with Him, worship Him, see Him. And if you say, well, you know, I'm kind of on the margins, right? And I'm here on Easter. That counts for something, doesn't it? It does count for something. Glad you're here. We pray for these services. We pray for God's work among us. We pray for you. And I believe you are here on purpose today. More than your spouse dragging you here. Or your grandmother or whoever you're here with glad you're here. I'm glad God used them in love. Let's honor him and make much of him in our hearts and our lives and believe and follow 